Hey guys, it's Joshua. I hope you enjoy this episode of the podcast. I definitely enjoyed recording it, but I wanted to step in and say that I make a mistake in the introduction. In this episode, I speak with Stephanie L. Taylor, and I say in the introduction that she had a um, emotional support animal in her childhood to get her through her anxiety and depression, and that that was what inspired her. She did not specifically have an emotional support animal as a child, but rather was surrounded by pets and animals, and it was something that uh, brought her a lot of comfort and solace as a child, and that was one of many inspirations for her career path. Thank you. I really enjoyed talking with her, and I hope that you get a lot of value out of this episode. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the podcast. Today I'll be talking with Stephanie L. Taylor. Stephanie is a licensed therapist specializing in animal-assisted therapy. We'll be discussing her new book, Animals That Heal, which is available for pre-order and comes out September 1st. Stephanie has struggled with anxiety and depression in the past, and having a therapy animal in her life changed everything. She also hosts the Inner Phoenix, the mental health podcast for military families. Thank you for joining me, Stephanie. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to, to talking with you. Uh, for those who don't know, I guess we can just ask kind of a basic question. Uh, what is animal-assisted therapy? So it's basically mental health therapy that uses an animal in the session. Um, so this could be a dog, um, a cat, um, and even a horse, actually. I've used a couple horses uh, in some sessions as well. So it can really be any type of animal that would provide therapeutic benefit uh, to the client at that time. So is this, would this not apply when someone has um, kind of a uh, therapy dog or something that they keep with them all the time? This is just where they have the animal in the session. So there's three different type of what I call assistance animals. Okay. Uh, the ones that are in the therapy sessions, those would be therapy animals. Those are also the ones that you see in nursing homes um, or visiting college students during finals week. <laughs> <laughs> Relatable. Yes, um, they've been very helpful. <laughs> and so they help people relieve stress um, and they help multiple people. Um, they do have, they're usually registered by an organization and they have gone through training. Um, okay. I was going to ask you how, how animals become certified uh, to be therapy animals. Yeah. So it really depends on the organization. Uh, there are some that require a minimum of a canine good citizen um, certificate, I think is what it's called. And other places require more in-depth training. So they may require that as a baseline and then also right. to go through their own training, uh, training schedule as well. Very cool. So that, that was the kind, of, uh, the kind of animal that you had for your treatment then was one that was just with you in the sessions or one so that you actually, had with you at all times. So I didn't actually do... So when I was in treatment, I didn't do animal assisted therapy. Um, that oh, has my bad. Been, yeah, that has been some that I have used with some clients, um, mainly when I was working on a ranch uh, and we were doing um, uh, equine assisted therapy. So we were using horses to help people with PTSD. Um, okay. When, when was this? this? Was this when you had first started as, as a therapist or was this like... When did you start working with, uh, with animals, with animal-assisted therapy? Um, so I would say probably about a year ago, um, I was working um, on a ranch in Bulverde, Texas, called the Reckless Rangers. And we're, I wasn't technically doing therapy at that time. I was doing, um, I was, it was therapeutic interventions, but it wasn't therapy. Um, what's the, what are, what, what's the difference? Therapeutic interventions? Is that like a short-term counseling thing? So it is actually technically not therapy because you don't have a, a licensed therapist in the session with you. Um, you would have a, you would have someone that's like certified in uh, mental health, um, equine, um, equine practice. And then you would also have a horse handler 
And so this one is just helping them work with the horses. And as a result, their symptoms kind of go away. Oh, wow. Um, it's kind of more like peer support um, than actual therapy. Right. That's really cool, though. I didn't even know that horses were, uh, were used as therapy animals. I saw, I did see, though, that you have a horse. Do you ride? I do. Um, I used to do endurance riding, so I would ride about 30 miles in under seven hours. Wow. Um, that was a lot of fun. It was, it was hard, but um, I like going fast. I don't really like the boring trail rides. Um, right. I'm more of a boring trail ride kind of guy. That's just me, though. <laughs> uh, when did you start doing that? Was that before or after um, you got involved with, with animal therapy? Did you always kind of have a thing for horses, or was that uh, a result of seeing the impact that, um, that they had had on these clients? Yeah, so I had actually grown up with animals. Um, I've had cats, dogs. Um, I got my first horse when I was eight, so I always grew up around animals. Um, and I know that my pets helped me through some really tough times. Uh, and so when I got to counseling, I was kind of like, hmm, we'll see if this works. And then um, when I learned about animal assisted therapy, that's when I was really hooked on it. Yeah, it's, it's something that at first is a little is a little strange and then you think about it and you think about the fact that we grow up with animals with pets that bring us comfort it just makes sense to amplify that in a more professional setting i think like any form of therapy or counseling is taking something that we would find comforting or um or soothing or like uh helpful in self-development in a small way that we would find naturally in life and then kind of really driving it home and using that as a treatment method yeah, there's been a ton of research on the health benefits of um, just pets in general. Um, things like lowered heart, um, lowered heart disease, uh, less stress, um, people heal faster, um, even if they've just interacted with the animal a couple times during their treatment. It showed a significant decrease um, in their healing time and the amount of pain that they actually experience. Wow. How, how, do, how does one diagnose um, which kind of animal someone would get, or, or is it usually uh, pretty circumstantial? Like if like this person has X, struggles with this, so this is the kind of animal they're going to get, whether it be a dog or a horse or something else. So what I kind of look at is what, what they're struggling with and then also what it is that I'm trying to bring about in the session. So some things are easier to do with a dog. Uh, they're obviously more mobile. You can take them places a lot easier than you can a horse. For sure, uh, unless you want to ride the horse. Right, but then you can't really go very far very fast. That's true. One time I was in Colorado. I was at a museum. Uh, we left. We had we had dinner reservations. We got out of the museum and there was just someone just walking horses on a horse, walking like a herd of, of 50 cows behind them. But they were not going too fast. We missed our dinner. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Getting stuck behind um, herds and tractors. And I grew up in the country, so I know all about getting stuck behind farm equipment and and farm oh, man. Animals. It, is, it is something I, I grew up in a small town as well I'm in I'm in the midwest in Missouri and uh, sometimes you know I've, I've been on the way to to a class or something or on my way to work and it's like yep there's a tractor in front of me and it's not going anywhere so I'm this is not this is just is what it is you just kind of learn to accept those slow moments you know yeah it definitely <laughs> helps you uh, with your patience Yes, absolutely. I, I have friends who live in uh, St. Louis and Chicago, and sometimes I am just amazed when I sit down to have a conversation or a meal with them, and they're constantly on from one thing to the next. And it's not everybody. It's a very like personal thing, but um, and it varies a lot from person to person, but I have met some people from the city, and I think it's, I think it's more common in areas like that uh, to kind of bounce your attention span around a little bit more. 
you know, or, or feel like you need to be up and doing something. And when you're sitting down to do one thing, your mind is on the, the next word, the next sentence, the next conversation and the next action. Does that make sense? Yeah, I grew up in North Liberty, Indiana, and then I moved to San Antonio, Texas. So that was a pretty big shift for me too, especially with the driving and the traffic because people drive crazy in San Antonio and other large cities. Oh yeah, for sure. I've, I've almost been run over many times in, in Chicago. So did you move with your family to Texas? No, I actually moved to be with my then boyfriend. Um, he's now my husband. Uh, I wanted to move anywhere that was not Indiana when I graduated for my undergrad. Okay. Is there any Texas. specific uh, reason for that? Or, or is it just you just need, wanted to get away from home, try new things, go to a new place? Um, so Indiana is very boring. <laughs> I could see that. Sometimes I forget it exists. Yeah, uh, we're, we're the city that everyone just drives through to get somewhere else. <laughs> I, I I know that feeling. Our busiest road is a highway that just kind of plows through the town. <laughs> so speaking of your husband, is he in the military? Is that where the inspiration comes from for the Inner Phoenix or does it come from somewhere else? Yes, my husband, he's now in the reserves, but he did four years active duty and he was active duty when I met him. Um, and we actually live in Fort Hood, Texas right now, which is a, a big military city. Wow. Did you guys move around a lot when he, when he was active duty or have you always kind of been in that area? So I kind of caught him on the tail end of his active duty career. So um, he's been in the reserves since I moved in with him. And so we haven't really moved too much. Um, we've kind of stayed kind of in the central Texas area. Um, but we've been talking about possibly going um, back active duty in a couple years, but I'm not sure uh, what's all going to come of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my, uh, my grandparents were both in the army. They actually met in the army. And uh, my mom was a self-proclaimed army brat as a result and was kind of, she had lived in uh, Germany for a little bit. She lived in Hawaii for a little bit. So it was kind of all over the place. So I think you made the right move catching him on, on the tail end there. Yeah, thankfully, I haven't dealt with all the hecticness of active duty. So right. I'm pretty thankful about that because I was able to actually finish my master's degree in one city. Oh, yeah, that's incredible. Not having to transfer all over the place when you're in school for that long. Um, so I saw I, I listened to a little bit of, of the Inner Phoenix um, and you've talked to all kinds of different people on there. Um, I think there's five episodes out. Is that right? Or are there more? Yes, I should be releasing the next one pretty soon. Okay, okay, fantastic. And you've talked, have you talked, because um, I didn't listen to all of them, have you, have you talked with one-on-one uh, -on -one with members of families who have, who have uh, their husband or their wife in the military and uh, active duty kind of hectic all over the place? Um, and if so, or in general from your personal experience, uh, do you have any advice uh, for people who might be going through that situation right now and be as general or as specific as you want. We can have a conversation about it. So most of the people that I've talked to on there are a military spouse or are a former military themselves. Um, and I think my biggest advice for having to deal with that is learning to be flexible. Um, that was my biggest issue when I first, um, moved in with my husband and had to deal with deployments and everything was that I expected everything to be a certain way. And I, mm. we made plans. So I expected those to stay. So learning how to be flexible is one of the biggest um, advice I can give along with finding your tribe. Um, one of the episodes um, was on how to deal with the first year of being a military spouse. And yes, there are a bunch of people that will try to one up you that will try to kind of be like, oh, well, you know, that's not that bad. I've had it worse. <laughs> uh, but finding, finding your tribe, finding the people that are going to support you, even if it is only going to be for a couple of years while you're at that duty station. Um, that's one of the biggest things. So a lot of the re research has shown that the better social support you have 
the more resilient uh, you will actually be when you're going through a lot of the hardships. Absolutely. And thank you for that. I think one of the, like one of the main things I was doing some research on uh, military spouses. And one of the, one of the main things of course, is struggling uh, with loneliness. Um, Do you have any kids? Do you guys have kids? We don't. We're waiting until this next deployment is over. Okay. That's, that's, that's probably, uh, that's that's probably on the safe side. Um, I was going to ask, I was asking because I was going to ask if you had any advice for, uh, for parents in the military. Have you spoken with any on your podcast or in general? Um, I haven't, but there are a lot of people that I know here at Fort Hood that do have kids. Um, and, you know, the same advice for, you know, find a tribe, find other mothers that right. are going through what you're going through because people outside of the military they kind of understand, but they don't really get it. And right. so finding those people that you can have play dates with, that you can kind of um, take turns babysitting so you can go out and have some time away from your kids can be really important. Um, I know for our location, we have a Fort Hood Ladies Meetup Facebook group, and a lot of the events on there are kid friendly. Um, and I know that that the people that started it uh, were at other locations and they had started them there as well. So whatever your duty station is, there may be a meetup Facebook group that you can meet other spouses. You can um, bring your kids. You don't have to feel shamed of, Oh, well, I can't find a babysitter, so I can't come. Um, It just, even if you do have to incorporate your kids, there are definitely ways to go out and meet other people. Right. And that's good advice too, I think, for, for parenting in general, as far as finding your tribe of, of other like-minded parents, just so you can help each other out. Um, that's great. That's great. I, I think it's really interesting to hear about uh, Fort Hood. Is that what it's called? Fort Hood? Yeah. Okay. Um, and the fact that finding your tribe uh, as a military spouse, potentially um, is kind of an unexpected fruit, or maybe it's not unexpected for you guys, but for me, I hadn't even thought about that as an unexpected fruit of living uh, in what is essentially a military city like that. I think that um, a lot of people, when that image first comes to mind of living uh, in a community of people who are in the military, um, initially they're like, well, I, I would have to be uprooted and move away from my hometown and my family and my community, my tribe. Um, but then you're seeking a new tribe and and perhaps these people will soon have more in common with you than the people back home did in certain ways. So that's actually really cool uh, to hear. Yeah. And sometimes when you PCS or you have a permanent change of station, sometimes your friends at old duty stations show up at your next one as well. Oh man. (laughs) Nice. You guys have been at Fort Hood the entire time or you guys transferred from somewhere else? Uh, we've been at Fort Hood most of the time. Okay, gotcha. See, that, that that's really fascinating too, though. I hadn't thought about that either, about the tribe kind of uh, migrating with you potentially, just depending on how, how it breaks down. Hmm. So was, uh, not to switch gears, but uh, was you having pets and being comforted by them, like the entirety of the motivation to seek a career in animal assisted therapy and do you work solely in animal assisted therapy or are you a therapist and that's one of the many things that you do I don't want to underestimate your capacity in your career so right now um, at my main job I don't actually use animal assisted therapy because I work at a prison and we can't okay. have animals um, on that would the be really unit. yeah that, would... <laughs> um, that makes sense so I do substance abuse counseling at the prison. Um, okay. And, so animal and, assisted therapy is something that you are uh, interested in and something that you've obviously written about, but it's not your main job right now. Right. There is a uh, ranch around here that I am developing their program for um, animal assisted therapy using the horses. Uh, so I was kind of doing it in Bulverde, and then I'm trying. I'm working on transferring it um, back to here. Transferring the ranch. 
So transferring the work that I've been doing. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. That's really cool. When did this project start as far as you uh, working on that program on the ranch, developing it? So the owner and I have been talking uh, for a couple months now um, where she kind of has different phases that she is starting. And so we're, I'm a little um, in the pipeline still of what we're going to be launching. Um, right. And that's, I have also finished um, my master's degree recently and I'm working on my second license. So we're kind of waiting for me to finish school and have a little bit more time to really devote to it. Sure. Well, in the ranch, um, was the ranch's initial purpose uh, for any kind of animal assisted therapy or did you come to her like, look, I know what we can do with these horses? So I had posted on Facebook, I can't re remember what, and she had contacted me because it was something that she was interested in, but she didn't have the mental health background that I did. Um, so it was something that she wanted to add, but was looking for the right person to help her with. Okay, that's cool. And you guys get to kind of uh, mess your professions together. And then you also have your background uh, with horses. When you said you um, did the endurance races, the endurance rides with the horses, uh, was that something that you did when you were like a child or like, a, or is that something that you did more recently? That I think was about two years ago. Okay. So that wasn't that long ago. No, that was right after I'd moved to Texas. Um, and I had met a gal that did a, did it a bunch. Um, and so I was like, well, I want to compete with my horse. <laughs> And so I kind of just joined up with her um, when she would go to to the races and just um, hitch with her. Did you have a horse before you moved to Texas or did, or did you just decide I'm going to Texas? I might as well get a horse. So I had a horse growing up, but I sold him once I started my um, started my second semester in my undergrad. And then when I moved to Texas, uh, we bought another horse. Okay. Very cool. Was that, how long had you had the horse before? Was that like hard for you emo emotionally to let go of the horse that you had had in Indiana? Well, I had that horse for about 10 years. So wow. it was pretty hard. <laughs> uh, but I was, I kept in touch with the owner on Facebook. So um, That's good. And I got to see him when I would come back into town. So it was, it was an easier transition. That's great. So you don't ride competitively now, but you just kind of ride uh, ride casually, ride places when you feel like it, maybe take up the highway, maybe slow someone down. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just have not had any time, um, with everything that I've had going on. So, right. Yeah. I with the, with the, to, uh, give up that. Hey, the horse will still be there, you know, when you're not working on, uh, developing, um, animal assisted therapy on a ranch and, and publishing your book and, and doing a podcast and everything. I, I find the fact, I didn't know that you were working on that ranch, but I think that's very cool given the fact that you're working on so many other things uh, simultaneously. And then you have your um, full-time job in the prison as a substance abuse counselor. When did you start there? I started there six months ago. Did you have experience in substance abuse counseling before that? Uh, not really. I'd taken my addictions class and I had my uh, licensed chemical dependency um, counselor intern license, but I've learned a lot uh, working at this at the prison. Um, it's not as scary as I first expected it to be. Really, even the first day? Well, the first I would say the first week was pretty scary, um, but once I got to know the clients and I kind of got used to having to go through the gate and getting patted down um, on their random in inspections. I kind of just got used to it. Right. I think, well, I think that's what happens when people go to prison too. <laughs> you, you just get used to it after a while. Yeah, there's definitely a adjustment period for our clients, especially when this is their first prison experience. Hopefully, hopefully their last prison experience, right? Yeah. Every time they leave, I always um, tell them, I hope I never see you again. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's the appropriate response. Um, has that been, uh, not distracting, but 
but tolling at all working with substance substance abuse specifically i mean i can just imagine the the horror stories involved in that i have some friends that are uh, just a local area social workers who work with people in rehab centers and everything and just some of the stories i've heard from them it's just it's 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 a little crazy you know what that'll do to your life yeah i think for me i i understand that um that their addiction kind of took a hold of them. And so their experiences weren't something that they chose. And right. so I'm able to show more compassion than being more shocked, I guess. Yeah, I think that's important. I think that's, as someone who's not involved in those conversations one-on-one, -on -one, as someone who doesn't know those people individually and sees them as people, I think it's easier um, to see it, to, to almost like demonize it um, to where you can't separate the activity uh, from the person and the addiction from the person it has a hold of. Um, I think that's a, that's a pretty significant problem that we have culturally, right? Where we can't separate the addiction from the person it's taken over. Definitely. I remember when I first started, I was like, oh my God, I'm working at a prison. This is going to be so scary. I wonder if there's going to be any fights. Um, but then, turns yeah. out everyone's just hanging out playing cards and stuff I, I mean we've had a couple fights um, but nothing really too bad and so I've kind of been able to see them as a person first and with an addiction second and yeah. so even though yes they're in prison they have a felony it's not it doesn't define them as much as people expects it to. Right. And when you, when you look at it that way, I mean, you can apply that to any mental illness situation where it doesn't have to, and that's important for them to know too, that it doesn't define them. You know, if I, if I go up to someone who's addicted to a certain drug and then tell them that, um, that or treat them like they're not separate from the addiction that has a hold of them, they're going to identify with that even more. And like I was saying, I think the same is true for, for any mental health situation. Uh, or mental illness, where if you don't allow them to, to identify themselves outside of that problem, then they just will become it and internalize it um, and not be able to let go of it and make significant progress. You can tell me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying this, this is kind of my perspective on it as, a, as an unlicensed non-professional, but as someone who's thought about this a little bit. Yeah, it's, it can be hard because they may not at first even see that they have a problem. Um, mm. they, you mean the addicts that you work with in the prison might not even think that they're addicted or they might not think it's as serious as it is? They may not see it as serious as it is. They, they may say, well, um, I'm able to have a house. I'm able to have, you know, have all my bills paid or they may think that everything is under control or it's not as bad as what it seems to be. And so they're very resistant at first, but then helping them see, you know, how it has actually affected their life, how it's affected the people that they care about. That's usually the point where they start to see that there has been negative consequences in their lives. Right, right. Because they have to come to terms with the consequences that are there. So things don't spiral out of out of control uh, further in a much more noticeable way from their point of view, perhaps. Right. I, I, I spoke with, um, I think it was about three, three and a half weeks ago, uh, I met a lady who was a serious alcoholic and it was, and it was like damaging and destroying relationships in her lives socially and, and in her family and in her household. And um, we were talking about that, but her main concern in that was that she didn't know who she was, whether she was going to hire someone to clean her house or whether she was going to clean her house. And she kept talking about that. And it was so strange because that was the entire issue, but she uh, was so broken up about it. It was like all the energy um, that could and should have maybe been devoted to uh, the problems in her life because of the alcoholism. She was focusing on this seemingly minor issue um, because she couldn't come to terms of what was actually happening around her as a result of, of her addiction. It's just fascinating what people will 
uh, will do in those situations where they'll just completely divert and completely focus on something else because you can't just focus on nothing uh, when you're sober, at least. Yeah, and especially depending on what they're addicted to, even just coming off of the substance can be really hard for them as well. Um, there's some where it's really painful to come off. Depending on how much alcohol you have, you can actually um, you can actually die from if you are had too much alcohol in your system and you're coming off of it cold turkey, uh, there is a chance of you dying from that. And so not everyone always sees the risks that they're taking. That's so crazy. I didn't know that that was the case with alcohol. I mean, I kind of knew that and or assumed it with like certain hard drugs, like maybe like cocaine or heroin or something, but alcohol, I did, I did not know that, that you could reach a point where um, just coming off of it could kill you if there was so much of it in your system. Is it just your body becomes dependent on it or is it just a lot at once? Um, like, is it something you would have to do over a sustained period of time and then your body gets used to it and then you take it away and your body freaks out? Or is it like this person has alcohol poisoning, but we kind of have to ease them out of it? So when you're on a substance, it's messing with your brain chemicals. And so if you stop that all at once, your brain isn't producing those chemicals because it's been sublimated by the substance. And so sometimes when you take it off too quickly, it messes with the brain. And in the case of alcohol, they have what's called DTs, uh, delirium tremens. And it basically, if you get to that point, you have to be medically managed um, to, to safely come off of it. Wow. So it's, it's your, your brain stops producing certain chemicals under, under addictions to certain substances. And then maybe you can't function without those chemicals. Is that, is that usually what it comes down to physiologically? Yeah. And that's why sometimes, um, like if you're on a stimulant, uh, when you're coming off of it, you'll get really depressed because right. your, your brain isn't getting those chemicals. Um, and so sometimes when you're coming off of like a depressant, you'll get really anxious because usually the, the side effects when you're coming off are the opposite of what the effects of the drug were. Right. And people aren't quick to think, oh, my brain chemistry and think through this. It's more like, oh, this is how I felt before I took this drug or this is how I feel without it. You know, so then there's just the tendency immediately to, to go back to it. You know, it's like people forget that they were OK before. Um, and, and they become familiar with the state they're in immediately after taking it away. Um, yeah, I, I think that I think that's a significant part of the problem that perpetuates addiction internally for people in people's minds. It's this uh, familiarity with the self immediately after no longer being intoxicated or, or high or, or whatever it is. Hmm. Well, not to not to dwell on, on the substance abuse for for a super long period of time, just given that I know, although, although that although that's your job, obviously your main uh, pursuits um, creatively are, are uh, involved in um, animal assisted therapy. So, did you decide to write the book uh, as before or after you started working on the ranch? Is the book kind of a um, a component of that or a way of like getting the word out to people as far as what this can actually do? Um, or had you already kind of decided that you were going to write it beforehand or is it entirely its own animal? No pun intended. So it actually started when I first started my counseling program because the book also incorporates service animals and emotional support animals, which all three of those are different uh, when you include therapy animals. Right. And I had realized that most of the people in my program did not understand service dogs or emotional support animals. And once they were licensed, they would be able to write a letter for these for clients um, to grant them access to using them. And so I was concerned that these animals were going to be underutilized just because people didn't understand 
what the laws were um, surrounding them and what they could actually do. Mm -hmm. And then as well, um, I noticed a lot of people were looking to be able to use these animals and they had a hard time finding a therapist that would be willing to work with them to write them the letter so that they could use one. So that's kind An of emotional I... support animal specifically or also service animals? Also service animals. Uh, so both of them, usually when a therapist writes a letter, it is for housing and flights because with the Fair Housing Act, they lump service dogs and emotional support animals together under the term assistance animals. And the um, Air Carriers Access Act that covers the flights and airports, they put psychiatric service dogs in the same category as emotional support animals. So they also need a letter from a mental health professional. What would be the difference um, specifically or categorically between a psychiatric service dog and an emotional support animal? I feel like I have a decent idea, but I may not. And also just for those who, who might not even know what we're talking about in terms of the difference. So a psychiatric service dog is just a subset of a service animal. And they are tasked, trained to help a person with their disability. Um, and so for these, they have some type of psychiatric disability, and they have been trained for about two years, um, so they've had a lot of training. And the emotional support animals, they technically don't really require training. Um, the Air, Air Carriers Access Act does require them to be well-behaved in public, but they don't really quantify what that actually means. And okay. So, well, do you think they do you think they should quantify what that means, or do you think the animals are unique enough that it would be weird to do that, and you'd have animals being discharged from the program that shouldn't be? So, I feel like they should because of all the issues that are happening on flights. So, uh, you know, if a dog bites someone, that is not well behaved in public. Right. If a dog is growling and lunging at someone, that is not well behaved in public. But there is no standard that states what requirements is for well behaved in public. And it's going to be really hard for the government to say, well, this training is required because even with the emotional support animals, the handler has to be disabled by their mental health disorder. And most of the time, they may be on limited income. So it creates an undue hardship on them to require extra training. Wow. Is, so, so then they would be paying for the training out of pocket, and then maybe they can't even afford to have the, the animal anymore. Do people usually pay uh, for the animal itself out of pocket, or is that something that would be covered by a, a number of insurance policies? Insurance doesn't cover any of this. Okay. Uh, okay. So do you think that that's a problem or do you think that's okay? I think that if there was more rigorous testing and more rigorous standards that the insurance company put forward, then I think that they should be able to cover them. But service dogs can cost up to $20,000 depending on which program you go to. So I don't really see many insurance uh, programs that are going to want to front that money. Right. That makes sense, especially when you have the gray areas as far as not knowing how, what constitutes well-behaved in public, you think that if, the, if there was a clear outline of what that looks like, if there was, if it was more standardized, then maybe it would be easier uh, to adopt because at least then the companies know what, what they're getting into. Um, I think they're, they're also, when it comes to emotional support animals, in general, but also as separate from um, like service animals and then the, the, the uh, animal assisted therapy um, is this stigma against people who have emotional support animals. But it, from what you've told me, it sounds like um, that comes from a misconception, uh, the misunderstanding of the difference between them and other service animals in that they're, they're just not the same thing. It's not the same program and it's not the same treatment for the same need. Um, for example, if, if someone 
uh, needs a dog just to be able to to walk around if they have like a serious vision impairment or something, then that's an entirely different situation, an entirely different treatment than an animal that's there for emotional support. But each one is just as valid. I think there's this major misconception um, between between the two, just in which people uh, would say that emotional support animals aren't as as valid um, or people with them aren't as valid as people who have them for some kind of uh, immediately apparent physiological need. Do you know what I'm talking about as far as the kind of the cultural stigma there? Yeah, and I think going back to the research that shows all the benefits of just having a pet, when you add in a person with a disability, those benefits help make them live a better life, basically. It allows them to, um, you know, reduce their panic attacks because they're more calm at home. They may not have as much paranoia, and it kind of allows them to be back to baseline a little bit closer, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So the answer, so, so the answer, it sounds like um, to people with that misconception, kind of perpetuating that stigma, is just asking them are you comforted comforted excuse me by animals were you comforted by a pet when you were a kid because if so this is that times 10 for these people who who need treatment i really it's just not an issue i had thought through before i find that fascinating yeah and in my book i talk about the different levels of care Um, because in therapy and uh, medical practice there are different levels of care So you wouldn't send someone with a cold to surgery because that's not what they require. Right. And so I kind of view emotional support animals and service animals on different levels of care. Right. So someone that is still disabled by their uh, diagnoses, but maybe isn't as impaired as much may benefit better from an emotional support animal. And then someone who may need more assistance, um, especially if they need assistance outside of the home, then a service animal would be better for them. Right. Absolutely. I think that's a great way of looking at it too, as far as different levels of treatment, not that one is uh, valid and that one is, is less valid, but that they're just very different treatments with very, like for very people who have very different needs. And one is certainly more extreme than the other, but it's just a matter of what the patient or what the client is in need of. I think that's a great way of thinking about it. So in your book, um, is it like mostly awareness as far as working through problems like that, working through the concepts? Is it uh, more on uh, methodology? Um, what, do, what do you really get down to uh, in the book as far as like what is not necessarily the thesis, right? But what, what, what is the, the meat of it? What, what, are, what are you trying to um, explain to people and articulate and what are you trying to share? So the biggest thing is helping people go through their journey of a service dog or emotional support animal. And so I have chapters on um, talking with your therapist because that can be one of the hardest parts and one of the biggest barriers to receiving this type of care. Um, I talk about the ethics of it. I talk about the laws. There's a lot of information on the internet that talk about scam sites and they just want your money. And so I really break down what the laws actually say so that they have something that they can reference themselves. Um, I talk about training, about how to find an animal um, and how to overcome some of the common problems that I hear about. Common problems as in what? Not not necessarily, you can give examples if you'd like, but common problems in what uh, variety? So being stopped in public, um, dealing with family that may be unsupportive, things like that, things that hinder a person's ability to move about in the world with a service or emotional support animal. Right. So it's, it's, it, it works people or walks people through the treatment but then also um, provides them with, uh, with help in those kinds of scenarios that might discourage them from even having or pursuing or keeping the treatment uh, in the first place. You know, it t- tells them 
how this can be helpful, um, how to get through it, and then also how to contend uh, with the fact that not everybody is going to be supportive. I think that's I think that's a great process as far as walking people through the treatment. Yeah, and I'm on some Facebook groups, and so these were some of the common things that I saw people struggling with. And so I really wanted to not only give them a guide to how to get one, but also how to survive in the world um, right. once you have one. Right, that makes sense. I, I think as far as educating people on what the laws are um, and, and how to actually go through this process specifically is very, is very important. Um, as you said, the, the phishing sites online and things like that, where you're just trying to get the help that you need, um, or at least that you, that you think you need or have been told that you need, um, maybe even by some other you know, on online source, but you're just trying to get the help that you need and you're finding all this misinformation. I think that the fact that we live in you know, the era of information, we have uh, so much that we don't know what to do with it and so much of it that we don't know um, what to trust. And when you're looking for treatment, that can be really scary. You know, even if I'm just, I, I think I'm having flu symptoms. So I Google my symptoms and turns out I have leukemia or something, you, you know, not really, but that's what I think because I've Googled the symptoms and now I'm freaking out because I've been misinformed. So I think the fact that you've compiled in, in the, this information, um, as a section of your book, uh, is really, is really cool and really important for people um, that you've given them a verified source. You have your master's, you're a therapist. This is something that you care about, that you, that you have worked on and are working on. Um, I think that the, the authenticity of it all is not only admirable, but I think will be very helpful uh, to people um, who are both just interested in the treatment, but who are also pursuing it. Um, I think they'll, they'll get a lot out of it, it sounds like. Yeah, and I tried to make it very factual based. So I have, um, you know, a bunch of sources that I've gotten my information from. Um, I cite the actual laws. So when you read the book, you can verify what I'm saying by the research and the laws. Right, and that's that's I think that's also very important, especially given the. Um, the common social stigma against the treatment. So where you can point even those people to no, look, here's what the law says. Here's what the research says. This is all backed up. This is all verified or verifiable. It's very important. Very cool. Is there anything else that you wanted to share as far as the main points that you're hitting home um, in the book that maybe we haven't discussed yet? I think I've covered almost everything. It's just really a walkthrough section of the different aspects. And I think the chapter on working with the therapist is probably going to be the most helpful to people because not only does it talk from the client's perspective, but they're able to show their therapist and be like, you know, these are the questions that it asks. These are, you know, how I'm going to think it's helpful. This is the research that I've done. So the therapist is probably going to take them a lot more seriously if they know that they've actually done their research and it's been a thought out thing and not just something, oh, I saw this online, so I want one too. Right, that makes sense. So what would you say is, is the main goal then of, of publishing this? Do you, are you leaning more towards, as far as what you envision in the future for this book, are you leaning more towards seeing therapists recommending this to their clients and patients um, or that you are like specifically for that purpose of people who are in the treatment or seriously considering it? Um, or are you also interested in um, also envisioning people who aren't pursuing the treatment and aren't even really considering it, but want to know more about it? Would this also be a book for those kinds of people? Or is that a completely different situation? And maybe that there's information they can get out of it, but they might be more interested um, just talking to you or, or learning online or something like that? Or is there an entirely different goal that I haven't thought of? So it's really being able to help people who are interested in this. Um, I call it a therapeutic intervention because that's basically what it is. And right. whether they are the client and they want the help themselves, or if they're a therapist and they want to understand what it is that their clients need to do to receive one of these animals, um, it kind of helps on both fronts. That makes sense. So it's, it's, very, it's very much um, 
for that purpose, for the purpose of clients who are considering it and for therapists who are considering, or who, who, for therapists whose clients are considering it, if maybe they uh, don't feel completely informed on the topic or if they're considering uh, pursuing this with a client for the first time or even just trying to do it better. Um, I hadn't see that's one thing I hadn't thought about was the I idea of the therapists, um, therapists themselves reading this and getting a lot out of it, but I could absolutely see that. Um, I wanted to ask you kind of a bonus question um, that I just kind of got from reading descriptions on your podcast. And then I listened to episode uh, two and part of episode three, but I hadn't listened to this one. Um, is that okay if I ask you a question about the podcast? It's kind of specifically uh, what you talked about in one of the episodes. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, it, this, you recently spoke with a master's student. I don't, I don't remember her name, studying uh, clinical mental health counseling. Yeah, that was uh, you discussed how do what? I'm sorry. That was Nikki Prinz. Nikki Krenz? Prinz. P -R -I -N -S. Prinz. P-R-I-N-S. Nikki Prinz. Shout out Nikki Prinz. Thank you. Um, you discussed how mythology has played a role in how people view mental health in the past uh, and currently, as well as how pop culture portrays mental health. I'm really interested in the former. Um, a lot of my like listeners and readers will know that I'm very interested in mythology and kind of the impact that uh, ancient mythologies have had on, or even, you know, maybe not ancient, but um, comparatively modern mythologies have had on our social structures and the way we even just perceive one another and one another's actions and mental states. So I'm really interested in the former, and I imagine the latter would kind of come up in the conversation naturally because they kind of flow together. So I wanted to generally, um, and don't feel like we have to go super in depth with this, but I'm, it's just something I'm interested in. So I wanted to ask you uh, about, about that, or um, kind of where you ended up uh, after that conversation, as far as just contemplating the roles that mythology has has played in mental health, and even how that might may have tied into your profession so far, has that um, had any impact on how you've thought of your career as a therapist and your interactions with your clients? So one of the things it taught me is that a lot of our beliefs about mental health are very ingrained in our culture, and the messages we receive from the people that raise us. And it's not always a conscious message. It's sometimes can just be in our wording, in the stories that, were, that are told. Uh, so really looking at how ingrained this is in people's lives without them even realizing Right. That makes sense. And I think even that, that kind of comes back as well to the issue of uh, stigmas against um, emo emotional support animals, where it's people have been told this is how it is. This is, you know, people have been given the concrete example of a blind man with a cane walking with a dog and have maybe haven't been given culturally or haven't been taught um, the example of someone who really needs an emotional support animal. So they see that and it contradicts this um, presupposition they have in their mind, this image that's already there, that maybe they didn't put there themselves, that isn't based in research, it's based in culture. Um, so what you're doing specifically in that field, uh, in, in the field of service animals and emotional support animals and animal assistive therapy, and providing people with verifiable research, uh, rather than um, that, that might contradict their cultural presuppositions, but that might do so uh, ultimately for the better. Um, I think that that's an important thing to do. And I think that that's, that that's really cool. Um, I think that you answered, you answered the question pretty comprehensively. Uh, and I, and I, and pretty, um, oh, what's the word? Not quickly, but comprehensively and succinctly. That's the word succinctly. I needed it. If I didn't think of that word, I was going to be freaking out after we got off this call for the next like 20 minutes, trying to remember what it was. <laughs> Is there anything else you wanted to uh, share with the audience? Any, any points that you wanted to cover? Anything about the book or the podcast? Um, when does your podcast come out? Is it on a, on a weekly schedule or something? So the Inner Phoenix comes out um, every other Monday. Um, I may move that to weekly once my schedule kind of frees up. But right now, but every other week is what I have it set to. Okay. Fantastic. And then the book Animals That Heal uh, comes out September 1st and is available for pre-order. Is it on Amazon or is it on your website? It's on Amazon. Um, I have the Kindle up right now and I'm working on the cover for the paperback. So that should be up uh, 
in within a week or so. Okay, fantastic. I will, even though it doesn't apply to me specifically as someone who's pursuing this treatment and I'm definitely not a therapist, I will be reading it and I look forward to that. I look forward to um, having my, uh, what are probably still there, misconceptions um, about the practice uh, kind of broken down. And I've really, I really enjoyed talking with you. I feel like I've learned a lot about the treatment and about uh, the people involved in it and about your practice. Thank you. I've enjoyed it So thank it you too. for, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you for coming on. And I hope people have found uh, value in, in what you have to say and what you have to teach both here on your podcast and on your book. I use the word both really inappropriately there because I listed three things, but that's okay. Thank you for coming on. And I look forward to potentially talking with you in the future. Good luck with the book and the podcast. I'll be, I'll be staying, staying tuned. Thank you.